Um, I want to um, come back to the last point about resources, intellectual resources within traditions. Now, how would one define this tradition? Uh, it, it, um, these intellectual resources are historical. Uh, they are also evolving and legitimized over time as a consequence of the moment, movement of history. And uh, therefore, um, they can be legitimized in and through colonial positions, and they become part of dominant positions also. So to retrieve these traditions, and as you said, it's a question of norms. It's a normative things, what you can retrieve. Uh, it can be local. It, so is there a geography to this? And um, is, that, is this geography related to an intellectual tradition of social movements that retrieved it at a certain point of time? And the memory loss has taken place about it. Uh, these are historical questions, but they are imperative to ask because um, you also constantly mention Singapore versus Malaysia. And there are different Malaysias that are there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and Malaysia is also a conception of a nation. And there are many nations within that Malaysia also. So um, when we talk of retrieval and, uh, and effacing uh, uh, mem one kind of memory and substituting with, with different kinds of memories, um, um, and then questioning the dominant um, positions in this. Social theory needs to locate it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where does one locate it? With what concepts, with what geographies, with what uh, conceptual schemas? And this, question, this relates to your first two positions, theoretical innovation and methodological pluralism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I, I didn't get the specificities of how to do this, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, um, um, and, um, your discussion on Ravens and Bignola's position is interesting, but it does not give that answer. Okay. And you want to push for this answer. Okay. So would you like to comment on yes. how, to, how to extend that, yeah. uh, that you have just said? Yeah, right. thank you. That, that's uh, an excellent question. Um, I have um, recently begun to think more seriously about that. I think I didn't need to think about it um, in the past because, in a sense, I cheated. You know, I talked about tradition, but I cheated because my going back to tradition, um, uh, I was going back to Ibn Khaldun. And I'm saying that I cheated because this is something that's already there. Everybody knows about Ibn Khaldun. Everybody talks about him. But uh, all I had to do was to actually do the the conceptual, the theoretical work. Because people talked about Ibn Khaldun, but they never developed Khaldunian historical sociology. Right? Um, but then people did ask me, um, all right, apart from Ibn Khaldun, who else? And that, the, 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 that, that's when the problem uh, arises. Um, people uh, ask, um, in the Malay world, who are the uh, equivalents uh, of Ibn Khaldun that we can use as you know, um, sources that we can refer to as tradition and, and, and use as sources for theorizing in modern social science. So then that raises the question, as, you know, uh, the, the question of how we understand uh, our tradition. Um, and I think the, you know, when, you, when you are thinking of retrieving from tradition, as you put it, uh, the, the question is, uh, for me, there are actually competing traditions, right? They are both part of the tradition. They, um, uh, but they have to be understood. These competing traditions need to be understood in order for us to then go about the project of uh, retrieval. 
So for example, I think the, the nature of the competing traditions will be different in different uh, societies, in different states, in different uh, civilizations. Um, for some people, the tradition might be a religious one. For others, it may be uh, seen in other terms. But in the case of, um, certainly in the case of the Malay world, of Southeast Asia, I would say that we can identify at least two competing traditions. You have, um, and I speak about the Islamic period, all right? Um, so dating back from about a thousand years ago. Um, <clears throat> you have at least two competing traditions. One is a, a kind of um, uh, egalitarian um, uh, tradition that stresses on um, uh, equality, that stresses on uh, rule, on, um, on justice, uh, a, a kind of democratic order in terms of um, uh, the flow of uh, knowledge and so on and so forth. Then you have a very feudalistic tradition uh, which stresses on hierarchy, that stresses on, um, you know, on um, um, <clears throat> um, or, uh, well, it's an, an order uh, which is, which reads authoritarian ideas into the same tradition that the more egalitarian uh, tradition uses. Um, the egalitarian tradition tends to be more sophistic. The feudal tradition tends to be more um, based on jurisprudence. Right? So you can, we can understand uh, uh, the differences between these two traditions. Now the tradition that has become dominant in Malaysia is the feudalistic tradition. Partly thanks to the British, which uh, reinforced uh, the, the feudal uh, order, but made the rulers, um, you know, salaried officials of the empire, basically, um, and that was inherited, um, uh, and, and that uh, role of the rulers was inherited um, uh, during the uh, period of independence, and uh, now you have a society that is obsessed with. Um, um, What's the term for it? Um, titles um, and uh, with hierarchy, uh, and there's a lot. This idea of differ, deferring to hierarchy, um, uh, and this permeates all levels of society, including academia. Right. So when we say get out of this and go back to tradition, we need to specify what we mean by the tradition. We don't want to uh, to reinforce what is in fact being reinforced. The whole movement to uh, decolonize history actually is a movement to nationalize history with nationalism being understood as Malay nationalism so it's a very narrow sense and it's a reinforcing of the of the uh, feudalistic tradition that I was uh, referring to so when people like myself are saying go, go back to tradition we mean the other type of uh, tradition the more egalitarian uh, tradition so it's not we're not only coming up against Academic dependency, intellectual imperialism, but also another tradition. So one actually has to theorize, you know, uh, tradition uh, in order to uh, talk about uh, retrieval. Yeah. So we have time for one uh, very short, specific question. If you put your hands up first, actually. So, so thank you for it. In terms of your engagement, I think you are engaged simultaneously with the political and the moral in a far more open and transformational sense. So to make the best of this open and creative engagement, we would be helped if you also work with the category of political economy, which you refer to, moral economy, but also moral sociology and spiritual ecology. It is in that sense, your engagement with Walter Mingolo, for example, one would explore humbly what is your critique of Walter Mingolo. For example, from the same space, if we invite, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, this other thinker, you know, who talks about transmodern, so the uh, Enric Dussel. So in Enric Dussel's journey, also in Arthur, Arturo Escobar's late work, there is a deep opening to the spiritual. So the point is, how do we retrieve a different kind of critique from that space? And your reference to 
the earlier generation of critique, for example, from India, it is not that there was a lack of the critique of the capital. For example, J.P.S. Uvroy, Science and Swaraj. Mm. It was not a Marxist critique of cap capital, but it was a Gandhian critique, Manoranjan mm. Mahanti's work which builds on. My final query would be that your own notion of autonomous is really a plea for autonomous, which is also at the same time a multiple interconnectedness. And, and therefore, the notion of the symbolic that you conclude with, the symbol is a symbol of resistance. But we also need to cultivate a far more wider meaning of the symbolic, where the symbolic is, symbolic is referring not only to the past and the present, but also it refers to a different kind of future. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. I, I, um, I'm not ready to, you know, to uh, really answer that question. Um, um, it would take uh, too long. But um, ca can I just? Um, and some, a lot of it was comment. But can I can I just um, refer to the, uh, the the last couple of points about autonomous? First of all, that phrase autonomous social science is not mine. Um, I, I use it, um, but it's um, something that was discussed by by my father um, on the idea of autonomous uh, social science. That was the term he used. He didn't talk about indigenization or uh, decolonization. He talked about autonomous, the need for autonomous social science. And I think the idea is that. There's no such thing as independence, actually, but uh, there is autonomy. Um, you said multiple interconnectedness. Um, I, I do think of uh, that uh, problem. I'm not sure exactly what you mean uh, by that, but it, it reminds me of um, the importance. Um, namely, that maybe that's also a, a big difference between our generation uh, and the previous generation, um, there's more connection, I think, between those of us working in the global south across the different uh, communities today than there used to be um, before. Not that there was no connection at all, right? Um, but, uh, you know, we hardly knew in Southeast Asia any of the, the people in the Middle East working in this area. We had hardly any connection with the uh, Latin Americans. Um, our connection was mainly in Asia. And I think in Southeast Asia, our connection was mainly with the Indians, um, uh, not with, uh, with the Middle East um, and not with Latin America um, and not with scholars working on these issues in the, 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 the North itself. Um, and that also needs to be made clear. I mean, we need to also have this, this kind of interconnectedness among us working in the um, in the south. Uh, mine is a, a, a comment rather than a question, so it will be brief. Uh, I just wanted to call attention to the importance of one of the things Farid uh, points out in the first of his list of five characteristics of social science in the decolonial mode. Very nice phrase, I think. Um, and that is that um, the, the process of building that kind of knowledge means requires us to demystify and interrogate not only the existing northern dominated mainstream but also the apparent alternatives to it, whether they're Islamic economics or authoritarian versions of indigenous knowledge as in South Africa and, and so on. And to me that uh, is, is an important signal that the problems we're dealing with in this, um, in this seminar are not capable of being resolved simply by, if you like, choosing an existing position from among multiple epistemes or knowledge systems that exist. The problems we're dealing with are really about what kind of social science we build for the future. Uh, and that involves critique. In, in all directions, yeah. not just one.